think I've messed up the red box. That's all right. I'll come back and fix it later. All right. <laughs> Good evening. Wonderful to see everybody. And uh, let's go ahead and begin with a song. Number 564, In the Sweet By and By. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. sing on that beautiful shore. The melodious songs of the blessed and the spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessings of rest in the sweet Everybody have a nice, cool first part of the week? Because I didn't. <laughs> our, our electric was out till 12.30 today from 9 o'clock Monday morning, or Monday evening. So praise the Lord for electric. <laughs> okay, our missionary of the week this week are Gary and Ann Lane. Uh, they are missionaries to the deaf of Mexico. Gary is a young 73 and Ann is a 69. Uh, as you know, know if you all know this, uh, Gary is from Ironton, Ohio, right down the river, and Ann is from St. Albans, West Virginia. I grew up with Ann Lane, so and, uh, Ann and her brother Dan Stripling, and they're with Baptist International Missions Incorporated and a church planner and mentor to the deaf in Mexico. This was written May 23rd. Philippians 1.3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And he started out talking about not communicating, that we haven't been getting letters and things like that. So we'll take care of that, hopefully. We'll get, get the letters coming. But on down about the fourth paragraph here it says we're on the field because God called us and because he put it in your heart to support this ministry we want you to be aware of the developments and blessings <clears throat> that God is, is directing our way as well as special prayer requests we might have we do not forward messages or send anything except family ministry news from here we want desperately to maintain good communication with you so we'll do that we praise the Lord that the government has finally removed restrictions from public areas here. Listen to this. 
I understand that they formally declared the pandemic to be over. Most of us are being very careful around groups, and as far as I know, face coverings are still required at the airports. The church is meeting, but we have the same problem as many of you. For nearly two years, our doors have been closed with few exceptions, especially when it seemed to slow down some, the government permitted, an opening of the public places and then closed them within a few days. The on again, off again caused many of the deaf to lose the habit of faithfully attending church. We've just returned from our field conference from Mexico and Latin America. I believe it was one of the best meetings we have experienced. We are privileged to see missionary friends we haven't seen in several years and heard great messages from the Word of God. We praise the Lord, our family as well. And Gary's been off all medications for diabetes for over a year, and it hadn't been too long ago that he was like seven or 800 in his count. He was really in trouble there for a while, so he's off all medications. That's pretty good. So. Anne had her appendix taken out last July after rupturing, but God blessed in a wonderful way in that she sustained no abscess or infection. Lance, Cheyenne's oldest son, often walks with Gary for 45 minutes a day at a fast pace. You probably don't remember this, but Lance was near death, really near death, had some really major physical problems. He couldn't walk. He couldn't walk, and now he's walking for 45 minutes a day at a fast pace. So praise the Lord for that. Ethan has returned to a regular school after overcoming his fears of going back. John and family and Faith Ann and family are all doing well, as is Cynthia's, Faith Ann's daughter, new baby, great-grandchild number three. It seems that our embassy no longer warns of the danger of COVID here, but we are still on a no-travel list due to violence. Where they live, a lot of gangs around in their area. So that's something we can always pray for, for the lanes and, and, and where they live at. We are so thankful for your prayers and his protection. Pray for Mexico. For deaf souls in Mexico, Gary and Ann Lane. And Pastor Ray asked me if I knew where, how they got into the deaf ministry. I really don't, but maybe we'll find out. Just, just uh, I thought I'm kind of interested in that. But they've been faithful for, I think they've been with this ministry for 40, somewhere around 41 years now. And we've been supporting them as long as I've been here. So that's quite a few years. That's over 40 years. So I figure we started supporting them about the time they went into this. So. So let's remember the lanes in our prayers this week. All of our missionaries, just remember each one. Uh, just keep them strong, and let's pray for them right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the, your house tonight. Lord, just thank you for the coolness in the church today. And just, Lord, just thank you again that, that uh, the electric came on for, for us and Pastor Scott and Leanne today. And, Lord, I pray you'll just be with us now as we have church. Be with Pastor Ray as he teaches. Or just use him just to teach us things that we need to hear. Lord, I say a special prayer for the lanes right now, for Gary and Ann and their ministry to the deaf in Mexico. Continue to use this couple, Lord, in, in a mighty way. Lord, just uh, reach out to the deaf of Mexico and Latin America, really, and just uh, uh, let the ministry draw people to you in each one of those countries. Keep them healthy, keep them safe, especially down there in the region they're in. But we, we love you, we praise you for everything you do in our lives. Continue to watch over and guide and direct us. Thank you for Jesus, thank you for saving us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, good evening to you. Let's turn to the longest psalm in the Bible and back one chapter. So where are we headed? Psalm 118, Psalm 119, the longest um, psalm in all the Bible, and uh, I will tell you this, that I'm picking up my dear bride at the airport tonight at 1030, um, she left Monday a week ago, so she's been gone uh, nine days and never received her luggage, never did, never received it, so she's coming home without luggage. Um, and I told her I'd let her wear some of my clothes when she gets home. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I just, I, I don't know, I, that would drive me bonkers. She's, you know, and we always had to ask her whether she got it. She never, you know, complained about it, but I cannot imagine being over there that long and never having received it. 
All right. Um, so here's, here's the situation. We are talking about customs and manners in the Bible. I'll let you know that. Um, lesson eight is on trades and professions. Now here's just a quick review here, just a little bit. We talked the first one in trades and professions about shepherding. Spent a whole lesson on shepherds. It's amazing how many scripture verses talk about uh, shepherds, the great shepherd, shepherding. It's just all throughout scripture. Um, then we talked about some other professions. We talked about the potter and how in Jeremiah, Jeremiah goes down to the house of the potter and he observes from the potter and basically the potter is making a vessel. At some point he doesn't like what he sees uh, in the potter and so he just smashes it to the platen and starts all over. And the whole story that Jeremiah is supposed to learn from the potter is that although God allows us to make decisions and so forth in life, there are times where God takes his red marker and adjusts his li our lives just for his glory. And to the unbeliever, that sounds absolutely ludicrous. But I trust that. I absolutely, do you trust God's red pen? I trust God's red pen. Uh, the potter, you know, uh, in Isaiah 45, 9, it was reemphasized when he said, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen vessels. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or, uh, I, I love this phrase, your work has no handles. You know, here's the pat, pot evaluating and said, how am I going to be used? There's, a, there's no handles. There's a great lesson from that. And the scripture goes on to say, again, the same thing in Isaiah that, that the clay maker, the potter, has the right to do with the pot whatever he chooses to do. Then we went from there and we talked about the carpenter. There's credit given to this as the save, our Savior being a carpenter. For instance, they say he was a son of a carpenter in Matthew 13. In Mark chapter 6, it says he was actually a carpenter himself. It's interesting that there's less analogies or, or illustrations from carpentry than probably most professions. He does not, Jesus did not spend a lot of time talking about uh, carpentry. Um, then we talked about the word being tecton, which just simply means a contractor or an artisan. And so it's not a, a carpenter like we think of. We think of carpenters making houses. A carpenter back then did not make houses. You made your own house. Or if you were wealthy enough, you had your servants make your house. Um, the, the real definition of, of a carpenter would just be one who worked with his hands and Probably with wood would be apparent. Um, then we talked about the fishermen. Um, the Bible makes a distinction between the individual fisherman, which I call it an angler, and a professional one, one who did it for a living. The former does it with a, a hook and a pole, or probably they were just a stick and a string and a hook in the Old Testament times. They probably didn't even have barbs on their hooks. Maybe they did, I don't know. Um, have you ever had, I know some of y'all are fishermen, have y'all had to ever fish at a place that wouldn't let you use barbs on your hooks? I hate that because I barely can get them on the hook, let alone let them wiggle off of that hook. But anyway, that's what they call the angler. And then the other one was the professional would cast a net with a hand or the drag net where with a group of people would draw in. So we talked about them and, and the Bible gave much, much to do about being fishers of men. And, it, and they remember what we really learned from the lesson of the fishermen was that fishermen work in tandem. They work together in order to bring in the fish. And we brought the challenge from that scripture that we as believers and Christians ought to work together for the salvation of the souls of men. All right, so now we're talking about a mason. What in the world's a mason? Believe it or not, A.J. is a trained mason. If you need to know anything there is about masonry, A.J.'s your guy right here. Um, while the carpenter and the potter, they, they made temporary elements, okay? Wood, mud. The mason made more enduring structures from mortar and from stone. I happen to know, and I don't know why I know stupid um, dates and times, but I happen to know that cement was not invented until like 18, I don't know, 30, 40, something in that. So they didn't have cement like we think of it today. 
Um, but they made, they made structures that were more permanent in nature. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit. What does the Bible <clears throat> talk about in Masons that we can take and use in our everyday life? All right? Think of overlapping Legos. Anybody grew up with Legos other than me? You know, if you take a Lego and you just put one on top of another, top of another, they're easily broken apart, pulled apart. If you overlap the Lego back and forth, you know, half lap uh, across the way, it becomes a fairly strong joint. That's what a mason would do in order to make his, his uh, structure um, um, better. Um, I know absolutely nothing about masonry. And Bruce Gray, I'm surprised you didn't say amen to that, because here a few years ago, I decided that it would be a good idea to have the front of my garage match my house with brick. And I started one little section of mine, and it looked like whoever did it was inebriated the whole time. And so, so I called my buddy Bruce and said, hey, Bruce, how would you like a little job? And so Bruce came over, and if you, you ever go over to my garage, here's what you'll see. There's this nice, smooth um, wall above the garage that looks just magnificent. And then to the left is this wall that looks again like an inebriated mason did it. And so um, there is an art form to masonry. And I learned that there was an art form, though Bruce will concur that I did not learn that art form. I just learned that there was an art form to it. So, all right, think of this in the mason because there's some great, I, I really hope I can drive this point to, through to you. In Haggai, when we studied the minor prophets, Haggai made this comment. Is, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while the house of God lies in ruins? Um, so while this house or the house of God lays in ruins. He was saying to them, they have come now out of captivity. He was a post-exilic uh, prophet. They were living in a, a nice lifestyle and they were building permanent houses. So when it says paneled or tiled houses in the Bible, in Haggai, it's talking about permanent house dwellings that they were planning and living in for years. And this was a house that was made by a, man, a, a mason, a paneled house. And he actually challenges them and says, yeah, you're making permanent houses for you while the house of God lays in ruins. And it was an indictment to them. So then we read this about foundations, all right? And that's what I want to talk about for just a minute. Um, the, if you ever drive down South Charleston, you will see a huge building. And it is, everybody calls it around here, the stamping plant. Well, I come to a little bit of knowledge. I wish Greg Toman were here tonight. Greg, when you listen to this, you should have been here to, to defend yourself. But Greg Toman, and if you want to find somebody full of worthless information, Greg Toman's your name, your man. Um, Greg Toman told me they chose that place because it was an ordinance plant, not an ordinance plant, an ordinance plant. Ordinance is military um, high-grade um, weaponry is what they, they basically made there. Do you know when that place was made, it employed 11,000 people at the time. Um, I've not been here nearly long enough to, to realize that. Now it's been broken up and used for multiple different things. But that huge place was, was originally planted right there for three reasons. One being is the river's access to railroad. The second being because there was a river right there. And the third one was because there was a bedrock system of rock below the ground deep that was only existed in a couple places in all of the East Coast. And um, if you want to know all the details about that, ask Greg Toman. He'll tell you all the details about that. But here's what we're going to talk about is foundations with a mason because there's a great biblical application to this. And here I take from, from the book that I've used so many times, the Manners and Customs book in Bible times, um, a good foundation is imperative in building Middle Eastern land. It's important to build down. 
Why would it be important to build down, as they call it? You're building down because if you've ever been in the Middle East, you know it's kind of like uh, um, out in the Midwest west where everything's just sand. It's just sand everywhere. And if you just build on the sand, you know what happens is that sand shifts and moves. And unless you build down to something structurally into a stone, a rock base, it will expand and contract over time. It gets very hot. We think 100 degrees is ridiculously hot. Sometimes in the Middle East, it gets true temperature of 120 over there. So it gets ridiculously hot. Things uh, contrast, they shrink and expand. And what happens is it gets destroyed and it turns to absolute rubble. So it's important that they build down. Now here's what I wanted. We're going to go to Psalm 119, 18 in just a minute. A mason would generally, and this is their word, not mine, okay? This is, this is from a group of people that may or may not even know Christ. I don't know that they do. A mason would generally, and now here's what I want you to do. I want you to think through what these biblical applications will be. A mason would generally only build on a foundation that he had built himself. To do differently would place his own construction in jeopardy, as he would not know of the quality of the work that was done before him. So, Generally, a builder, a mason would come in, he'd want to lay the foundation. Um, the church that I came from, Faith Bible Church, um, we built a, uh, they call them glue lambs. These beams right here are glue lambs. They're glue laminated wood beams. And our auditorium was built with those things. And the problem was those glue lambs were the basis for holding up the whole building. They are for this auditorium. They held up the whole building, and there were four on one side and four on the other that all met in the middle and held the structure of the building. The only problem was when they built the foundations, which were um, like 16 feet deep and 8 feet wide, they miscalculated on the center, center beam. And when they went to set the glue lamp, there was no foundation there. And it became a huge problem in the construction because of the foundation or the lack thereof in the foundation. So and a worker would want to know that the quality of the foundation is built. All right. Then there's what we call the cornerstone. Oops, I didn't skip one, did I? No, okay. All right. A cornerstone is the most important part of a building structure. It's the broad square stone used where two walls intersect. All right, so if you have a square building, you would have how many cornerstones? You would have four, all right? And generally, the weakest part in your building would be somewhere you're going to put an entryway that way there, and you would compromise one of the walls in doing so. So you have to build a lintel or something across there. The cornerstones then would hold the entire weight of all of the building. And so they were the most important thing. It literally holds the weight of the entire building. So much care was taken in the choosing of the stone. And if it was irregular, if it, as they looked at it, and they went to the mason yard or wherever they went, I kind of picture in my mind a mason yard kind of like if you've ever had a countertop put in and you put it granite, granite, you usually went to the granite yard to pick out a piece of granite that you wanted. And here they do the same thing. And it is absolutely imperative and if it doesn't look good they'll pass it by and so it would be that they'll just go to, to another stone and this is again from the manners and customs of bible lands so think through now the biblical application of what we just talked about in the mesa all right so psalm 118 look in verse let's start in verse 21 psalm 118 and verse 21 i thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the psalmist talking to God. And then verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now what's he talking about here? Help me out. Come on, Bible scholars, help me out. Who, who is he talking about? Wait a minute. This is, this is at least twelve or 1,400 years before Jesus came. How can he possibly be talking about Jesus? The, 
stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, verse 23. It is marvelous in our eyes. And the verse that we always, always, always use out of context. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What's the day? The day is when Christ was rejected and he becomes the cornerstone of the entire church. Um, the verse is used again at um, the entering into Jerusalem. And um, it's just the whole parents is this, is this verse so many, so many years before is using the illustration of the mason. So in, in Matthew 21, which I put on the screen for you, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, which by the way, authenticate the Psalms by Jesus calling them scripture. Have you never read in the scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Almost the exact same verbiage, same wording. And so here's the point, is that, have you ever wondered what physically Jesus looked like? I had a guy come into church, into this church, one day, and he said, you know one of the things I don't like about this church? And I said, no, but I'm sure you're about to tell me. And he said, he said, there's not a picture of our Lord anywhere in here. Nowhere. And I said, do you know what he looked like? Because I don't know what he looked like. Most, we, we take from Da Vinci's time this picture of Jesus. He, if, you, if you ever didn't realize that the picture that we look at of Jesus or the painting that became famous of Jesus, he's Italian, he has long hair, he has olive skin, and matter of fact, he's pretty white, <laughs> white in that picture. Um, I would say Jesus looked probably nothing like that because the thing that I'd like the least about that photo is he looks effeminate. Um, there are several things that tell us that Jesus wasn't effeminate. Um, the, he walks from Jerusalem to a town that's 12 miles away, and he calls it half a day's journey. Uh, a 12-mile hike is not half a day's journey for me. That's, that's three and a half days journey for me. Um, so, so anybody that, that, you know, was in that kind of walking condition was probably physically very good, okay? But I want to tell you this. One of the reasons that, that I don't think that we should have pictures of Jesus is one that it is the same reason that, that in the Old Testament where Jesus or God decided, God Jehovah, decided not to allow the children of Israel to know where the bones of Moses were because they would have worshipped it. And I think it would become to us an idol seeing a picture of Jesus that, that, that we really looked at. Matter of fact, I don't like, I really, really don't like a crucifix because a crucifix shows Christ on the cross. I think the picture of Christianity is more an empty tomb than it is a Savior on the cross. And so as we look at that, here's what I'm trying to get at is this, is that Jesus was probably, probably a rough-looking character. Um, he didn't come as the king and demanding respect and demanding direction and demanding that people follow him and demanding that people worship him. He came, the Bible says, lonely, uh, even in the, in the point where at what we call Palm Sunday, where he came riding on the, the foal of a colt. Um, he was a gentle, simple man that was probably in very good physical condition, but the builders or the religious people of the day passed him by as being insignificant, and yet he was the foundation of the church, or he was the founder of the church. And so here's the point, is a mason in the Middle East would understand that you would try to pick out a stone that looked like it had no cracks, no blemishes, nothing, no, the sandstone coming off of it, and you would make sure that it was fitted properly. But here we have God deciding to build the church differently. One of the things that amaze people today is that the very fact that the pyramids still stand. I mean, there was no, there was no cement 
that was put into them. The point being is probably the reason that pyramids stand today is because they were so tightly joined that water didn't get in between the cracks of what they did. And so here's the illustration, this one, the application, is that Christ, in founding his church, uses things that people would generally pass by. You know, what's amazing to me is, have you ever seen, um, matter of fact, I, I, I have a fellow in mind that he is, he's a small man, he, in public, he just talks, you know, very simple, very closed, and he stands in the pulpit, and the power of God is on him, and he speaks with eloquence, and he speaks powerfully from the Word of God. But when, when the world looks at him, he looks like he's a mealy little old man. You know, here's the idea is this, is that in the Mason's eyes, we want the strongest, the most noble, the, the, the biggest, the broadest. God doesn't use and build his church that way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else building upon it. Now, pause for just a minute. We just read from a historian that most builders only wanted to build on a foundation if they built the foundation. God thinks so much differently. And it's such a contrast to the eastern uh, um, man building, the eastern mason, that he understood that there was a contrast being made. Because when Jesus said, and the Apostle Paul here, According to the grace of God, I laid a foundation, and someone else built upon it. He's contrasting that God builds his work in a much different way than people build things. And then it says this, Let each of you take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so, here's the builder, understanding the mason, that as he's building, then he's looking for stones that are cut properly, stones that are rugged, stones that are heavy, stones that have no blemishes. And yet he's understanding that the contrast is God uses things that don't look so mobile, don't look so grand. Do you know you have two preachers of this church, neither one of them break five foot eight? Can you imagine that? Um, matter of fact, um, it, I don't know how many times Pastor Scott has a preacher come in here and said, this, this pulpit needs to be raised up. They don't like the level that we have the thing at because they, they can't read the so far away. But when guys are five foot seven and eight, it's perfect. That's just absolutely right. You know? But, you know, what I'm telling you is I pity you some of you big, tall, gangly people. I mean, you don't fit in an airplane, you don't fit in the back seat of a car. I mean, you know, you guys got a rough life. Whereas us little people, God can use greatly, right? Amen. All right. <laughs> Standing up for the little people. All right. <laughs> Ephesians 2 and verses 19 and 20. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now he's talking about the household of God. So we're talking about he's quite equipping the household of God. He's equating with a building. All right. So then it says this in verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And this is some great analogy made with the mason. And so an eastern mason knew exactly what he was talking about. Exactly. In, uh, in whom the whole structure, the whole kit and caboodle being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Have you ever watched... Um, Matter of fact, when they made the channel, the channel runs between France and where? Does anybody know? What is it? France and England, okay? When they made the channel, they started in France and started digging toward London or wherever in England. And in England, they did the opposite. Now, what are the chances that those guys were good enough when they came out at the end that those things would actually meet at the same place? Well, the truth of the matter is they had such good GPS and they had such, such plans of action that when those two things, bro when those things broke together, all of the 
all of the important VIPs were there, and they broke through on one side, and they're standing, they met the hole, and today we have this, this great channel. I've never been on it, but I think that would be cool to, to run in some time. But the point being is this, is that God has a master plan for the church. And, you know, I like the phrase in Scripture that says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, don't ever question what God is doing in his church. Have you ever looked, have you looked at the numbers of, of church attenders from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s into 2000s? And there's, in America, church attendance has gone gradually down. And you hit 2022 in this same timeline, and you know what happens in church attendance? It goes from 60% to below 50%, like boom. You know, the, the pandemic has um, just got people in a whole different mo mode of thinking. And one of the things that it has affected is church attendance. Huge. I mean, look at it. The timeline is, is significant. And so, I, you know, you scratch your head and you think, man, how are we, we going to survive? I mean, I think that with our church right here. You know, here we've got, you know, a few dozen people uh, in, in service here tonight. Um, how are we going to survive? God will have his way and his will. And we have to trust it. You know, here about a month ago, when Pastor Scott was preaching, he said, don't you ever not trust the gospel. And I got thinking about that. I'm thinking, you know, how many times do we like, somebody doesn't get saved, and we're like, man, I need to, I need to go convince that guy and get him saved. You know, I read some of the, um, I read some of the missionary questionnaires. Matter of fact, Pastor Scott just I mentioned one here a, a week or so ago. But some of the questionnaires say things like, "How many people did you get saved in the last year?" You know, and and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know that God works in the way that man even thinks. Every person who thought like that would have dropped the deputation or dropped the support of Jeremiah for sure because Jeremiah had no converts. And so here's what I'm thinking is the mason. Here's the, the analogy where I'm just trying to put together of the mason is that the mason is a builder and he thinks analytically. Um, we're getting engineers in here. Engineers are always this analytical thinking. You know, A plus B equals C, and you do it this way, and this is the way it happens, and blah, 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 blah. Well, sometimes we, we throw marketing so strongly into church work that we try to control the outcome, the direction, and we leave God out of the plan sometimes. He's contrasting to Masons here. He's saying the way you guys build, that's not at all how I build. Not at all how I build my church. Not even similarly. And that's the biblical application to the mason is you build much differently than I do. All right, now we're going to talk about the tanner. And, and man, you all listen very slowly on that, so let's hurry up on this, okay? The tanner and the dyer, I, I don't even know if that's a term, the dying person. That doesn't sound right either. Um, <laughs> the person who tanned and the person who died, who changed things to different colors, they were generally they were the same. They were combined professions. All I'm trying to get at. Scripture mentions dying several times, but we'll limit just to particularly today to tanning. All right. So one more lesson. We understand the lesson of the of the mason is God does not build like the mason does. And doesn't build like you anticipate. Okay. Here's the tan the tanner. The Bible talks about wine skins. All right. Now here's here's the whole background. Goat skins were used for making pliable containers for carrying liquids. Now, this isn't nearly as pretty as you may think. The goat skins are stripped off whole. The holes where the legs and the tails were located are sewn up, and the end where the neck was becomes the mouth or the spout of the bottle. Skins were laid out to dry in the sun, and like any other leather in time, it would begin to... Uh, become brittle, all right? This is what a wineskin looks like, all right? Do you know what this, you understand, this is a goat. Um, you think you know what that part is, but this is a leg. 
this is a leg, this is a leg, this is a leg, and this was its neck. And, and so basically, you gutted this thing out through, <laughs> through the neck, and the skin became the bottle. That is what the wineskin is. So the tanner could also make it smaller. What they would generally do is take the leg of a goat and cut it off and do the same thing, sew it around the back, and he would make a, a smaller container. All right? So here's, very quickly, the biblical application. In Matthew 9 and verse 17, Neither is wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so they are best preserved. Now, doesn't that bless your heart? Isn't that a fantastic thing? Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, it's repeated again in, Matthew, in Mark 2, 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. What in the world is he talking about? He's talking about the tanner making wineskins. Now, let me just walk through this. People came to Jesus in the subject that we just talked about. And they asked him, why do your disciples not, uh, why, aren't, why aren't they fasting like the Pharisees are fasting? They don't fast at all. And Jesus responded to them by giving them three parables, the last of which is the wineskins, okay? The first one is this, the bridegroom, okay? He, the illustration is basically this, is that a wedding in, West, in Eastern times, the, the bride, I mean, the groom would go away, he would prepare a home, and they would come get the bride, and that was the celebration. They would, fa they would fast, waiting for the, the groom to come, and then they'd have a big feast when, they, when the groom came, because that's when the, the wedding would happen. And Jesus says to them, why would my disciples fast when the groom is here? You know, the whole point of that story is, is they were, wait, they were, they were uh, fasting, waiting for the groom. You know, we fast because we're wanting an answer for God, from God. When we get an answer from God, um, then we celebrate. And so that's the point that he's making in the first story. The second, then, is this. A new patch on an old garment. Um, you have had old clothes. And you put, let's say they're cotton. You have a pair of cotton jeans, and you have ripped holes in them. So now you're in style in 2022. But you want to patch up a hole. You don't use something that has never shrunken before and put that on there because what happens is this. You wash them, then it shrinks, but the old jeans had already shrunk, and it actually will tear them. And so that's the illustration there, and I'll tell you the, the point here. Then the new wine. He says you don't go and get uh, new wine, which if you were, if you were having uh, grapes and, and they were fermenting or uh, they were being turned to juice, what would naturally happen to them? They would expand. And if you had an old, uh, rough-skinned old goat, it would burst. So you, you don't do that. You put it in something fresh and new. Here is the illustration, okay? All three illustrations point to the fact that old religious rituals are ridiculous when they looked with faith in Christ. Disciples were not fasting because they were now under the new covenant of grace and faith in Christ. And basically, the illustration that he was drawing from is this understand that we've got a new life. We don't go back to the old rituals. We don't go back to the law. How beautiful it is that we have new things. And he uses those three stories. So the whole wineskin story is simply this to the tanner. Of course, the tanner already knows that you don't, you know, you don't put fresh juice you know, as it starts to ferment into an old wineskin because it's going to burst. And he said the same thing. You can't take a believer saved by the grace of God and expect him to go back into rules and regulations of the law. But we do that, don't we? <laughs> we do that for sure. So those are the lessons very quickly from the mason and from the tanner. And the 
dying person. I still don't know what to call that person. All right. Anybody got any thoughts or opinions, uh, any additions? Then you always got something. You got something? I'll let, I'll let Dana. Go ahead, Dana. Is that right? You know what? I want to. I want to. I want to follow up on that because the information I'm going from is is several months old, and I bet that is. Uh, I bet that has changed just in the last several months. That's very interesting. Would you what? Yeah, yeah. She just said. She just read a recent article that said that the number of people going to church in America is now around 31 percent. I was saying 40, and that's just from months ago. Is that right? Denny, good. What are you going to say? Okay. You know, that, that, the Nazarite vow always gets confused with the Nazarenes a, a lot. But I really think probably what they did is that it's an old Italian uh, painting. And my guess is that they took a leader of the time and, and copied and painted him and, and said this is what Jesus looked like. That's because he, he, he looks very Italian. You look at the picture. He looks extremely Italian um, in that. Like what kind of fish are you talking about? Like big noses? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they're usually they're usually fairly small too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said he probably had a bowl haircut. Even further than that is, you know, Jesus told told him remember not to take two tunics. Jesus probably cut his hair like the poor person did. Is when it got so long, he took a knife and whacked it off. And, you know, so I doubt Jesus went to a barber, you know, I'd say he probably had a good buck knife, you know, and, and, and cut his own hair like that. Um, Bill? Oh, I mean, take, a, take a fresh piece of leather. Um, have you ever done any leather work? A fresh piece of leather is really pliable. You let it sit for a little bit. It's like having a, a Bible, like right now. Do what? Pliable. Yeah, I, when I say stretchable, I, yeah, more pliable than stretchable. But it would, it would hold. You know, it would not, it would not burst. It would be, it probably, it probably does stretch. Uh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll go to that. I, I, I haven't done a whole lot. I haven't done a whole lot of uh, leather work. Go ahead. Okay, that's another. You and Bill get together and talk about that, okay? <laughs> All right. It, it, yeah, use brains. Yeah. I don't find any biblical illustration in there about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yeah, I, I think it's just the whole reason of me wanting to, to share all this information is because we see so much through Western eyes that I think we get so many things out of context uh, that it just it didn't make sense to Eastern people, and that, or that's not the way, that's not what it's about. All right, go ahead, Bill. Most of this is my understanding, okay? And if you know more about masonry, you can, okay. Okay, my understanding is this: is most of it was it was it was um, sandstone sort of stone, which means that that it would generally sandstones would break apart, and it was it's more rare to have something that's thick usually sandstone is thin and when you had something that was thick and heavy for one it was hard to move about and plus it was a rarer stone to be thick wide and heavy 
it correct support the weight of the whole building yeah exactly it had to be thick big and heavy to, to support in that manner that's my understanding matter of fact um there's a church building in in marietta ohio that has um that brings a whole illustration to a cornerstone in their building and and it shows how it is is a sturdy stone and it's an interesting point anybody else all right, Mark, you want to come? Good. Oh, Frank, go ahead. I'm sorry. What happens then is the cornerstone, you put up one cornerstone, and it's got to be flat, and the deck will be all wood. Oh, that's good. Okay, that's good. All right, Frank is saying that generally the, the, the chief cornerstone, you would, um, the first cornerstone, you would make plumb and get it perfect, and then everything had to... Uh, connect or be plumb to the cornerstone. That's good. That's good. That's good. All right. I am officially on vacation. I'll see you in a week and a half. All right. Mark. Okay. Do we have any prayer requests over here? Please pray for our granddaughter Paige, Amy's daughter. She had um, emergency surgery for a herniated discs, um, so she's got some recovery time, and I think she'll be okay. But we're concerned. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, do we have a request over here? Have any prayer requests over on this side? I haven't heard anything else about the Clark boy, but um, because we're out of school now, but you know, just keep on praying for him and his situation with the cancer. Okay. Any other requests? Yeah, a lot of people are still without electricity. Okay, if we don't have any more, I'm going to have Mike close us in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is again great to be in your house. Father, it is great to be among brothers and sisters who desire to praise and worship you, Father, and to learn and to grow together. Lord, I pray that we would uh, stay faithful. I pray, Father, that we would stay true and pray that you would just continue to allow the strength of Jesus to flow in us, Father. What I ask, we cannot do on our own. It has to be through your son, Jesus. Father, I pray for those that uh, still do not have electric. I cannot imagine uh, with this heat and everything right now what some of these people are going through. Father, I do know it's encouraging to hear that uh, the power companies are doing the best they can. They're bringing in other people. Father, protect them as they're in a, in a hurry to get power back on. Uh, keep them safe as they're up there dealing with the high power uh, lines, Father. Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters, Father, that uh, cannot be here. Father, I continue to think about Champy, Father, and, and Tiana. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be with their health, Father. Lord, I pray that you would do that uh, which only you can do, Father. Lord, I pray for, for the Clark boy, Father. Lord, I pray that you would just be in that situation. And, Father, for uh, Jamie and, and mentioning the, the young lady tonight with the uh, um, um, disc issue, Father. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be with her. I pray, Father, that you would just allow her to heal. Father, you can do it. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. You can do it. Lord, I pray for, um, uh, for Toke, Father. Lord, she's doing better, but 
Boy, it would be nice if she would have some encouragement from us. I pray, Father, that we would uh, call her and give her, uh, uh, maybe stop in and see her, Father. Lord, I pray that uh, we would continue to uh, uh, be with our leadership, Father. Lord, it is easy for Satan to uh, play and to do things, Father. Lord, I pray that we would just ask the Lord to keep uh, keep him out and to keep our our leaders, Father, hooked and, and solid in the word, Father. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd be with our teachers. Lord, I pray that you would continue to give them the uh, desire to grow and to learn and to share, Father. I pray that you would just bless them for their uh, willingness to serve in this needed ministry, Father. And Lord, I do pray that we would, as a body of believers, as your local church, that we would be uh, a beacon to our community. Father, I cannot wait till we get into July when we can have the uh, picnic in, in, in the park, Father. And Lord, I pray that we would be in prayer for that. I pray that we would be telling people about that, not just waiting till the day, but letting people in our neighborhoods know that, hey, this will be a time we get together, just have some fun and fellowship. Father, I pray that we be in prayer for VBS. Father, it's been a long time since we've been rubbing some shoulders with some kids, Father. Lord, I pray that we would start with uh, putting their hearts into ours, that we would have a desire, Father, to pray for them. We don't know their names, but we know they're out there. Father, may we be willing to spend some time, some extra time in our closets, Father, praying that VBS would be an opportunity for us to bring those kids in our communities to us and give, a, give them a chance to hear the gospel. But more importantly, Father, be an opportunity to bring their parents too. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just continue to uh, uh, be with our youth, Father. Lord, it is a tough time. Father, I pray that you would just allow our youth uh, to uh, have ears to listen to, to our mentors, to each and every one that's here, Father, to uh, uh, let them hear the, from our perspective, Father, and may it be your perspective. Father, may we be praying for them, that they would have strength to confront the world, Father. And Lord, I ask you now just to, to, to go forth with us. I pray, Father, that those opportunities that... Uh, that there would be opportunities this week, Father, for us to uh, share the gospel with someone. Thank you, Father, for loving us first. Now may we go and show that love to the world. For I ask these things to your Son, Jesus Christ, and amen.